so this is, since it was for the applied math department, also there's a lot of math in this talk and there's a lot of kind of, it was motivated by applications and then it turned into kind of pure math for a while and then we went back to applications, in fact applications in data science. Okay, so I'm going to talk, just going to give you some motivation, then I'm going to talk about um, what it means with our definition for a graph to converge. Okay, most people think of graphs as discrete objects, but it turns out that there are reasonable ways of talking about how they converge. Then, um, given one of these continuum objects, how do you generate models of random graphs? And then, how do you use these things if you are trying to estimate the properties of an actual massive network like Facebook? If you're trying to, you know, get a snapshot of Facebook today and imagine how it's going to look when it has twice as many users. Okay, so everywhere we look, we see networks, you know, in we see technological networks, social networks, economic, biological networks. Now, interestingly, sometimes, you know, uh, things that should look very dissimilar land up looking similar, like a brain cell and the universe, okay? And, uh, and so this motivates a question of, you know, is, is, is there some limiting form that these two things are taking? By analogy to thermodynamics is a limit of statistical physics, since I come from physics, or differential equations as a limit of interacting particle systems. Is there a meaningful way to take a large network and define a limiting network and see what properties survive in the limit and possibly in the same way that it's much easier to deal with a differential equation than with an interacting particle system, easier to deal with, you know, um, uh, thermodynamics than statistical physics because a lot of the details are gone. Could you do the same thing with the limit of a network? Okay, so um, this was a journey that involved a lot of collaborators. So in the beginning, in 2004, we asked Lotsi Lovas and Vera Shoj and Kati Vestragambi, who are wonderful combinatorialist graph theorists, do graph theorists have graph limits? I, I just expected them to say yes. But they said no. And so this began this decade-long journey into mathematics. We used and developed a lot of kinds of mathematics. We worked with some other great people along the way. And then in December 2013, we were at a NIPS conference, and some people came up to me and said, oh, we're using your graphons, which are what we call these limits as non-parametric stochastic block models. And I had no idea what any of those words meant, but they were using them. I, I mean, I thought he was kidding. He said he was using them on real networks because, you know, we were like busy publishing math mathematics papers, long mathematics papers. And so since then, we've worked with a lot of students um, and we are doing work on estimation, on consistent estimation. So. Actual, um, actual statistics on whether we can use these things to estimate um, real networks. Okay, so first thing that we're gonna ask is what is a good measure of similarity among large graphs? If I gave you these pictures and asked which two of the three are more similar, you would say, well, by what criteria should I consider them to be similar, okay? Then uh, when do we call the sequence of graphs convergent? So if we have a measure of similarity, maybe we get a metric from that. Can we get convergence in that metric? And what are the properties of the limit? What is a good stochastic model for large networks? If I gave you something, could you generate lots of instances of a network? And finally, how, if we get a good model, how do we learn such a model from a, an observed network? So as I said, if we take you know, Facebook today, how do we fit parameters, or better yet, maybe a non-parametric model if it's very large and we don't want to overfit, from a network snapshot today to estimate the network later? And then, can we do this while protecting privacy? And this part of it actually started um, here at Columbia about two years ago. I was giving a talk in the theory you know, you guys have like a little theory day, and uh, 
and there was somebody in the, the, there was someone else, Adam Smith, who was giving a talk, and we were in, in the audience for his talk, and that's how all the differential privacy stuff on networks started. Okay, so, uh, so graphs are a set of vertices and a set of edges. The edges sit in an adjacency matrix, and there's a one in the adjacency matrix if X is connected to Y, and if X is not connected, then there's a zero. So can we take this and via some limit get a symmetric measurable function which in some way models this adjacency matrix, which models the edges in some way. And if we have such a model, can we then generate instances of a graph? And if we have a graph, a network, Facebook, LinkedIn, a biological network, can we estimate maybe what this function is and then use it to consistently generate random models that look like this at different sizes and in different ways? Okay, so here's some notation. Graph is vertices and edges. The degree of a vertex, I mean, this is all pretty standard, uh, standard notation. The average degree of a vertex in a graph, okay, is d bar. And then I say that a graph is sparse if that density goes to zero. So if I have n vertices, if I have little o of n squared edges, then it's gonna be a sparse graph. And if some positive fraction of sites are connected to all other sites, or you know, if I am connected with positive probability to a fraction of, of all the other sites, then it's a dense graph. And then we have measure spaces and don't really worry about those too much. Okay, so here are some examples of graphs. So, the erdos renyi random graph is just about the simplest graph generation model that we have. We say we have n vertices. I go to each pair of vertices and I connect them independently with a probability p. I get something which, you know, the, the, the probability that I have k neighbors turns out to fall off, um, to fall off exponentially in k very quickly. I could also take p to be a function of n, and then I get more interesting kinds, um, more interesting kinds of behavior. The stochastic block model is what people were always using to fit large networks. Okay, they were not massive, but large networks. They were saying, "Oh, I have k types of nodes, k colors of nodes of vertices on my network," and. Um, it, and they're connected to each other with probabilities pij. So if I'm red and you're blue, I'm connected to you with probability red blue. And I'm thinking of a symmetric matrix here, okay? Whereas if Kathy is also red, there's also a probability red red of, of connection, okay? And so this is kind of like a random graph, but it's got k different species or k different colors. Then of course, power law graphs act very differently. They don't, it doesn't fall off um, exponentially, the probability of k neighbors it falls off like a power law, okay, like a power of k. So let's talk about this first part, which is trying to get from a graph to some kind of limit. And of course, if you start thinking about it, when you define a limit, if I define a limit in a really strong way, I could define it so strongly that everything converged to the same point, no matter what I did. If I define it really weakly, then everything converges to a different point. So somehow, I want something which is meaningful, which gives me some meaningful limits. Of course, I can always define a limit, but I, I want something meaningful. So I'm gonna give you the, um, the heuristics so that you can think about it better. And then I'll do this for dense graphs. These are graphs with order n squared edges for n vertices and for sparse graphs. And real world networks are sparse graphs. Dense graphs are much easier mathematically, but real world networks tend to be, I mean, you're not connected to a positive fraction of everybody on Facebook, okay? Okay, so 
there's by now tons of work. I mean, that work with Lotsi and Vera and Kadi, and whenever I say, I'm, I'm always including me and Christian together. Christian's sitting there playing with his smartphone because he knows the talk, but BC is always Borgs and Chase. Um, so there are all kinds of notions of convergence which we came up with for different circumstances. The amazing thing, the thing that made us super happy about this was that, at least for dense graphs, all of these notions turned out to be the same. So, which makes you believe you're really on to something if a priori very different ways of defining a limit lead to the same limit. Then, what is the limit object? And actually, some of this work goes back to Aldous and Hoover around 1980, although they weren't really thinking of it in this way. Some of it goes back to uh, uh, Benjamini and Schramm around the year 2000. So maybe you just get an infinite graph out. Maybe you get this function that was that W that I had on the last slide, large deviation rates, all different kinds of limiting objects. And finally, when do you find convergent subsequences and there are different conditions and different things that will give you con convergent subsequences? Okay, so heuristically, I take the adjacency matrix of a graph, which is just a matrix. All the vertices are listed, you know, one to n, one to n, and if there's an edge there at ij, I, it's, it's a symmetric matrix. I color it black. Otherwise, I leave it blank, it's the color of white. And so, for example, for this graph, if I do that and I order the vertices in a certain way, these are the things that are connected, these are the things that are not connected, then I just think of taking a limit of that picture, okay? That's how you might think about it. If I take the random graph, this was this thing that you flip a p-weighted coin with p equals one half. It turns into this kind of gray thing, and it's just a constant function here. The only problem is, what about permutations of the vertices? Okay, I shouldn't care what I label things. I want isomorphism. You know, I, it shouldn't matter if I have an, an isomorphism. So if I relabel the vertices, I can turn this into this into this. So which is the right thing? So the isomorphism invariance on the matrix side turns into, so this is Christian Lotze and I, that this limit is unique up to measure preserving one-to-one -one maps, one-to-one -one onto maps, okay? So there's a lot of degeneracy on this side, okay? But, you know, in fact, there was already a lot of degeneracy on that side, too, because I should be able to relabel my, my vertices. Okay, so here are a few more examples. If I have a randomly grown uniform attachment graph, so I come in and I attach to any other site with the same probability, then I get this, which converges to that, which is a nice bounded function, okay? Um, if I do a randomly grown preferential attachment graph that I attach proportionally to how many vertices they're already connected to. I get this, which converges to this, which is unbounded, okay? So obviously I want some, I want to be able to deal with unbounded Ws because this is more like what Facebook and all these other things look like. Okay, so how do I compare two graphs of different sizes? I'm going to use this interesting metric or norm called the cut norm. So what this norm says is, you can think of T as S complement. Take your graph and break it up into two pieces, S and S complement, such that if I add up the weights of all the edges that I have to cut to separate it into those two pieces, that's a maximum. Now, what I want to do is I want to scale the two graphs, like these two graphs, to be the same size. So this has 147 sites and this has, you know, 185 sites, okay? And so, because I don't know how to get least common denominators, or maybe 147 is prime, I, I take every one of these and I blow and I blow each vertex here up 185 times and I form a complete bi bipartite graph there and I take every one of these and I blow it up 147 times and put complete bi and, and now they're the same, these blown up graphs are the same size. They both have 147 times 185 number of sites. I take the cut difference 
distance and the difference of their adjacency matrices. And then I better minimize overall permutations because I want permutation invariance. And I get what I call the cut metric. Or I could define continuous objects and a cut distance between them and then embed graphs into graphons, which I'm about to do. So a graphon is just a symmetric integrable function, like one of these two we just saw, the one minus max or log log. I can define the same kind of norm on graphons. So Fries and Conant had done this before we'd even come up with this notion of graph limits. Um, and so here, some function w of x and y I think of as kind of a continuous version of my adjacency matrix. So I still think of taking a cut and souping over all possible cuts. And so the cut distance between graphons now, instead of minimizing over all permutations, I minimize over all measure preserving bijection so that I get, so that I order my vertices in such a way to make this difference as small as it can be. But this is now, I take all measure preserving bijections to make this difference as small as it could be. And now I can think of any graph as actually a piecewise constant graph on, which I guess, um, Roy and Veitch call uh, uh, empirical graphons. I like that name. So, um, so I take a graph of n nodes and I take my unit square and I break it up into n pieces that are each, you know, so I have uh, 1 over n by 1 over n blocks and I have n squared of them. And I say that if, um, that, that I just make my graphon constant there. Okay, so, so I haven't taken any limit then, okay? And the cut metric does exactly what it's supposed to do. These two different notions of cut metric that I gave you are if, if, this, is, are the, if this is piecewise constant graphons corresponding to these particular graphs, then the cut metric is the same. And what so the first result that we were very excited about is that, well, no, so this is the definition and then I'll give you a result after that. Um, a sequence of dense graphs, this is, you know, positive density of, of edges is called metric convergent if it's Cauchy in this metric. And it's said to converge to a graph on W, so like this converges to that. Okay, which means that the difference converges to zero. Okay, I can think of a ton of other notions, so don't look at that. Let me just tell you what I'm thinking of. I could have a very local notion of what it means to converge, okay? I could ask you, so I have a whole sequence of graphs. I could ask you, oh, you're here too, Joey. Okay, so, um, the, so here the, um, the edge density converges, the triangle density converges, the four cycle density converges, the Peterson graph density converges, any subgraph that I can tell you, any finite subgraph, I want those densities to converge. This sounds totally different than metric convergence in the cut norm, in this weird norm. Okay, but our theorem was that for dense graphs, subgraphs converge if and only if this thing converges in metric. The combinatorialists love this because they always think of little graphs and densities of little graphs. Okay, but then there are so many other things. So now, kind of six years of thinking about different kinds of things. Statistical physics, I could put statistical physics models on and ask that the free energies converge. Computer science, I could say, I want all max cuts and min bisections and multi-way cuts to converge. There's some notion of quotients. There's some notion of large deviation rates. All the n. For dense graph sequences, metric convergence is equivalent to subgraph convergence. I just told you that on the last page. But it's also equivalent to all these other global notions of convergence. So all of a sudden we got an equivalence between global and local notions and you know, you're really feeling like you're, you're getting at something here. Some people ask me, sometimes does the spectrum of the graph converge? And yes, it does, but the spectrum itself doesn't imply that all these other, this, these are all stronger than the spectrum, um, than the spectrum converging. Okay, 
Now let's say I want to go to sparse graphs. The first sparse graph I might think of is a sparse graph of bounded degree, like you know, the cubic lattice or something, okay? There's no good notion of metric convergence there. There's an older notion of convergence called benjamini schramm convergence, after benjamini and Schramm. They chose a vertex, a random vertex, and they looked at uh, a convergence of a graph that was rooted at that random vertex. And it turns out that subgraph convergence, which is a very local notion, is the same as benjamini schramm convergence and is implied by convergence by this more global notion, but it is a strictly, this global notion is strictly stronger, okay? It's a strictly stronger notion. Now, the sparse graphs that we really care about, okay? So, like Facebook does not have, you're not connected to a positive fraction of, you know, the other billion and a half people on Facebook. However, there is no max of the number of people that anybody is connected to, okay? Um, in, in principle, I mean, some, some algorithms actually cut you off, but in principle, there's, there's nothing, okay? So what I really want is sparse graphs of unbounded degree, sparse graphs with hubs in them, okay? So here are local notions like subgraph frequency convergence really fall apart. Okay, they really, really fall apart. So let's think about why. Let's take a random graph, you know, one of these things where I flip this p-weighted coin every time, and, um, and so how many edges does it have? Well, every edge has two endpoints, that's n times n, okay? And if the edge density is n to the minus two-thirds, then it's n times n times n to the minus two-thirds is n to the four-thirds, so that's the edge density. What's the triangle density? It's n times, oh, wait a second, um, yeah, okay. n times n times n times n to the minus two thirds, n to the minus two thirds, n to the minus two thirds, which is n to the minus two, so it's n. So I could remove every single triangle in there without affecting my edge density. So I can't say edge density and triangle density, okay? Sparse graph doesn't have enough, enough, um, it, it, sub, subgraph frequency convergence is just too weak a, a notion here. Okay, so it turns out you need to let go of some of the fundamental results in dense graph theory, which is why it took so many years until we came up with what you should do with sparse graphs. There are all kinds of things that Mathematicians talk about summary lemmas and counting lemmas and everything, which don't go over easily to the sparse case. So, what do we do? Okay, well, here are the problems. The cut norm, which was this great norm that we used, is bounded by just the one norm, which is, you know, the interval with the absolute value inside, which is equal to the density of the graph, which goes to zero. So, even the simplest graph converges to something trivial, okay? So this is not a good thing. I mean, there's no contradiction, but this is just trivial, okay? You might think what I want to do then is divide through by the density, and I'm going to do that in a little while. Also, many real-life networks have power law degree distributions, but on the other hand, the max degree over the average degree is bounded for dense graphs, so that's another reason you don't like dense graphs. So the goal is to develop a theory which works for sparse graph sequences with mild assumptions on the density, like divergence of the average degree. Okay, so convergence of sparse graphs. Okay, there are two different notions. Um, the first notion was, um, was due to Bolabash and Reardon, though we generalized theirs. And the second notion was due to us and Henry Cohn and Yufei Zhao. So divide through by the density. Okay, since the density is going to zero, just divide through by it and see what's left. So, so here's a picture. Take these, divide through by the density, okay, and then call it convergent if this thing which is normalized con converges, okay? Leads to generalizations of many of the results of dense sequences. There's another thing 
that we could do, which was, um, which we did with Henry Cohn and Nina Holden, who's a student at MIT right now, and uh, 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 Roy and Vi did a similar thing at the same time. Extend this to the positive quadrant. So let's just look at a picture. So this is what we did last time. Here, instead of dividing through by the density, I'm going to stretch the metric inside, OK? And that would be another thing that we could do. And then, so, so I can either like divide through this way or I can stretch it that way. And those give us two very different theories, actually. So do these notions of convergence give subsequential convergence? No, mass can disappear up or out. But the solution to these problems is to develop some notion of regularity and say, oh, for this class of graphs, hopefully a very big class, either this will converge or that will converge. OK, so the advantages of this thing where we divide through by the density, we can get power law graphs con converging. We can get the degree distribution to converge. We can get a generating um, graph on for a random model. We can do differentially private estimation, a lot of nice things. The second way of doing it, which is something that the statisticians like a lot more, gives very long power law tails, multi-scale. Vertices which appear earlier tend to have larger degrees, gives completeness, um, and it leads to, and this is the thing that the, the um, statisticians really like, a projective exchangeable family of growing graphs, okay? Which means that basically uh, everything that grows, the, the projective piece, everything that, that in all, all the earlier graphs are subgraphs of your current graph. Okay, so now both of them sound pretty good. Can we get something that converges in both senses? When you have two things that are good, why not have them both? Well, actually, if both converge, then it's dense. So then we get back to the dense case. So we're really talking about two different classes of graphs, except for the dense case. So when you have your data, your data isn't going to be both unless you have a dense graph, okay, if, if you're trying to fit your, your data. And what sparsity can we achieve? And it turns out that for either of these notions, if we get convergence, then they have divergent average degree. So these are the kinds of graphs that we actually see. The average degree is diverging. In, in Facebook, the average degree is diverging because you have some real hubs there, okay? And yet, they're sparse. OK, so now let's think about where we are. We got these graph limits. So I said, if you take a graph, and all you have to do really for the dense case is just think of taking the adjacency matrix, coloring it in, and letting it converge, and then kind of blow your mind by thinking of all measure preserving projections. Um, for the sparse case, there are different ways of dealing with the fact that, you know, the density seems to be going to zero, you can either divide through by the density or you can stretch your space. Okay, so we've got this. So now the question is, if I give you one of these functions W, if God gives you one of these functions W and says, hey, this W actually describes LinkedIn, okay, here's a function and it describes LinkedIn, can I generate realizations of LinkedIn from it? Okay. And can I do it for dense graphs? Can I do it for sparse graphs? Dense is easier as usual. Okay. So for many, many years, since 1983, people have been using what is called the stochastic block model. This was this thing with k different colors, or k different types of nodes, okay? And, uh, you know, red has a certain probability of being connected to blue, a certain pro probability of being connected to green, and so on. Blue is a certain probability of being connected to itself. So I have a K by K matrix of probabilities of being connected independently. And so that was all very nice. The problem with this is your graphs get really large is that you might do overfitting. Because as N gets really large, K starts getting really large too. Like it grows with N sometimes. 
And so you have tons of parameters and you start to do overfitting. So a, a non-parametric model, but for dense graphs, already people had done in 2002. So, you know, this, this underlying thing, this omega is really a feature space. It's a features on which you're gonna connect to each other, okay? So maybe some very simple one-dimensional thing. It may be, oh, you're connecting to each other on some multi-parameter thing that's describing your musical tastes and your mathematical tastes and your height and <laughs> all these different things, you know, and your marital status, which is just, you know, married or divorced, you know, so it's all these different kinds of things. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna have, I'm, I'm gonna give you this function w of x and y, and now I'm gonna generate n random points, okay, let's say uniformly or in some way iid over, over this space, okay, and then I'm gonna plug those points in. So let's say I generate 128 of them, okay, or whatever. Um, and now I plug in w x1, x17. That's the probability now that the first, that x1 is connected to x17. And I just, and I can generate a graph doing this. And I call it the inhomogeneous random graph that's generated by this function w, okay? So given just this simple function, I now generate these points, I stick the points, I stick all n squared pairs into this function w, and I flip my coin, which is weighted by w of xi, xj, and I get a realization. I flip my coins again, and I get another realization. Okay, so relation to graph convergence, well, you know, if, if this is a graph on an arbitrary probability space, then it converges in the cut metric, so there's some good notion here. Okay, but we do have a problem. Um, if I'm given this sequence, so I, I, I give you a function, and you generate graphs with it, okay? Can I uniquely identify W? Can I uniquely identify, well, um, I mean, you, you can't because of this, um, you know, all measure preserving bijections. And it turns out that, um, that the, this distance is zero if and only if there's a third graph on and measure preserving maps which take both W and W prime. There was a mistake in the early statistics literature which said that there had to be one measure preserving map that takes one to the other, but there are counter, easy counter examples to that. So there have to be two measure preserving maps which take you to a third one. And this is, this sounds more powerful than it is, Diaconis and Janssen, and then also using our results with Lotzi. W is a graph on over an arbitrary probability space, then there's an equivalent graph on over zero, one. And you may say, oh, that's great. I have this really complicated feature space, which is my height and my mathematical ability, and my this and my that, and I'm just gonna reduce it to this one dimensional thing, zero, one, and I can do that. But when I do that, W might have started out a really nice function, and it might become horrendously ugly under this transformation. So if you are a real data scientist, you don't want to do that. You want to try to deal with it on its original feature space. Okay, so now there are a couple of properties that uh, statisticians really care about. A random sequence is called projective. If gn minus one is an induced subgraph of gn, what that means is that if I look back one step before, okay, I see all the edges still there, okay? Okay, I don't, I, I, I didn't delete any edges in going from step n minus one to step n. Oh, and it's called exchangeable if for all n the distribution is invariant under relabeling of the vertices and it's easy to see that this dense inhomogeneous random graph is projective and exchangeable and the converse of that was not so obvious um, Aldous and Hoover, it's called Aldous Hoover, although Hoover did it before Aldous and they did it independently. Aldous is better known in the stat community. Uh, if a dense sequence is projective and exchangeable, then there is a random graph on realization of it, of this 
thing that gets generated. Okay, so that's kind of a converse. And so one of the things that people were thinking is, is there kind of an analog for sparse graphs? Okay. Okay. So sparse graphs. Sparse graphs are harder. Hibolbosch and Reardon in 2007 said, you know, let's try to do the same thing, but let's talk about having a target density. Okay, so now um, what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to give you the W for Facebook, but I'm also going to give you the, the density at each of these times. Okay, and this density you're going to scale things with just like you took that norm and you divided it and the W grew really tall. Okay, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to generate IID these points and I'm going to stick them into the W, but I'm going to multiply by the density, which is kind of normalizing things nicely, and I don't want my probabilities to be bigger than one, so I want the probability that X I is connected to XJ to never be bigger than one, which it could be in this case, the density were really low. And I call the resulting graph an inhomogeneous random graph at this target density. And this is what these kinds of things look like. They have really nice properties. They generalize the sparse British Renyi graphs. They give power laws. They give nice convergence. They're exchangeable, but they're not projective. Because as I multiply by these densities, what may happen is that I have to delete an edge getting from this one to that one. Now, sometimes that's actually what you want. Sometimes your data edges are getting deleted, but sometimes they're not getting deleted. Okay, so a different way, very different way of doing it corresponds to that second way of stretching, okay? And uh, uh, Corona and Fox had a really nice paper, I think, in 2014, and oh, this is actually 2015, not 2016. It was generalized by, um, oh, that should have been a V, Roy and Veitch in 2015, and by us with our student in 2016. Um, we both came up with a similar generalization, um, which is a, a little complicated, but not that complicated. So we generate Poisson points with a certain, um, a certain intensity, and then I connect those points. I'm, I've given you this function W. I connect the points by sticking in all n squared possible things and getting probabilities and flipping coins, and then I remove the isolated vertices. And the first time a vertex appears, I'm going to say is its birth time, but I'm going to consider it hidden until it actually gets connected to somebody else. So let's look at this. Let's say after four time steps, these four points got generated, and then what happened was I stuck these numbers into here, I got certain probabilities, and it landed up that x2 got connected to x3 and x4 got connected to x2 also when I flip these coins with, you know, probability w of x2, x3, w of x2, x4, but x1, whenever I flipped, I got tails, it never got connected, didn't get connected by time four. Now I wait a little longer, now it's time seven, a few more points got generated, and look what happened. Point one appeared because it landed up getting connected to point seven, and point six landed up getting connected to points four and two, but point five still didn't get connected, it might get connected sometime later. Okay, and there's an edge process that is associated with this. We saw this picture going to this picture, and now I'm going to put little dots here whenever, the, so, you know, when, when X, X2 is connected to X3 and X2 is also connected to X4. Okay, so we see that and we see these and it turns out that there is a kind of exchangeability of this edge process. Okay, now I think it's interesting to look at the kinds of graphs that get generated. That thing where you rescale the height tends to generate graphs like this, which can give you power laws. This thing where you stretch gives you really long tails, even longer than power laws, kind of multi-scale, okay? So this graphon process, the main thing I wanna let you know, it can give you power laws, and it's 
jointly exchangeable, and it's projective. So this is the analog of the Aldous-Hoover theorem, that if we have a projective family of random graphs, where C, where the edge process is jointly exchangeable, and this has this nice property, then this is the analog of the Aldous-Hoover if and only if statement, okay? There has to exist a graph on which generates this if and only if the edge process is jointly exchangeable and has these uniform tails. Okay, finally now, so that was like a lot of math, but remember what we're doing. We've got these graphs, which everybody has known, you know, you're very used to graphs, okay? <laughs> And we took them and we showed that there's a nice way of getting limits out of them, okay? Which seem to have a lot of nice properties because many different kinds of limits give you the same thing. We've shown that if I give you one of these functions as a limit, you can actually generate random graphs that have properties which seem to be like the properties of the graph it came from, but the question is, Can I really do consistent estimation? If I look at Facebook, if I looked at LinkedIn, can I estimate this W in a way such that when I generate things from my estimate, they will be giving me the right graph back, okay? And I want this for unbounded Ws, and then in certain cases for bounded Ws, I'll be able to tell you at least in, in this case that I can do it differentially privately. Okay, so this is where the title comes from. If I have a single instance of Facebook today on N nodes, let's say a billion and a half nodes, I want to predict what happens when there are three billion people on Facebook. If we think of it as a graphon process, you know, many of them are already around, they just haven't gotten connected yet. That's why Mark Zuckerberg is going India, okay? He wants to get more of them to appear. Um, the, the traditional approach for modestly sized graphs is the stochastic block model. By the way, you know, some people have said to me, that seems crazy. Why do you think you can estimate like any network from a stochastic block model? That seems like such a limited thing, okay? Well, interestingly, I mentioned Samaretti's lemma before. Some of you may have heard of it. It's this really deep mathematical thing. Samaretti's lemma says that in randomness, there is order, <laughs> okay? And Kind of like the birthday paradox says, you know, boy, there's more order than you thought in this room. You know, probably some of us share a birthday, <laughs> okay? So Semaretti's lemma says, and this is my way of stating Semaretti's lemma, in its weak form says that any network that you find, let's first talk about dense graphs, okay? Any dense graph that you find is close to a stochastic block model in the cut norm. It's epsilon close to a stochastic block model in the cut norm if you take of order e to the constant over epsilon squared, so relatively large number if epsilon is small, blocks. So that's what it tells you. Everything looks up to epsilon like a stochastic block models. It's not a crazy way to have estimated. So these guys who were estimating from 1983 on using this had a gut feeling for the weak form of Samaretti's lemma, okay? They estimate the parameters of the model. They estimate all these PIJs or the probability that red is connected to blue, red is connected to green, red is connected to red, and they generate a new graph using the estimated parameters. Okay, the non-parametric approach, because you don't want that many parameters, is that you model G as a random graph, you estimate an approximation to the W, and then you generate a new graph using that estimation. So, there actually, I mean, there are people doing this. So, Edo, um, Edo 
Araldi, is that how he pronounces his name, Araldi, um, is using this on LinkedIn. He's going, he's looking at LinkedIn data, he's estimating a graph on from it, okay? And then he's telling LinkedIn about things, about properties of LinkedIn in the future using his estimate to generate graphs, okay? So our task is to estimate an approximation to the actual Facebook, the actual LinkedIn, from a single sample of this, for example, okay? <laughs> Where we've also got some estimation results for the one which is not normalized by density, but I'm not gonna talk about those here. So, more precisely, given a single sample of this, so I tell you the density of Facebook, and, and this is what I see from this. Can we get a consistent estimate to the generating graph on, say, in the L2 distance. The identifiability problem, well, this can only be identified up to equivalence under the, the cut metric. So what um, Wolf and uh, Wolf and Olde said was consider graph ons as equivalent classes and use an invariant version of this. And one nice way of saying it is that if U and W are graphons over two probability spaces, I can define an invariant L2 distance by infing overall couplings, and even if they're not probability spaces, I can do couplings. Okay, so previous approaches. So with stochastic block models, a lot of wonderful statisticians, um, you know, for the past 30 years have been using stochastic block models and proving some lovely results. For dense graphs, you know, results go back to Kallenberg and up to today, and sparse graphs, um, well, there was stuff on Hurlder continuous upper and lower bound on W. Now, one of the problems is, if I have an upper bound on W, okay, I don't have any power laws. Power laws correspond to unbounded W. So if I have a lower bound on W, that tells me that I can't have things like bipartite graphs, which is not good. I want to be able to model a bipartite graph. So our goal is consistent estimation for sparse graphs with arbitrary feature spaces and maybe a graph on its square integral or something, no upper or lower bounds on W. And here are our results. So what I'm gonna do, so A is Facebook today, okay? And I wanna get the stochastic block model on K blocks, which is closest to it by going over all different ways of reordering. My least squares algorithm is gonna ask me to output the K by K block matrix, which is closest to the actual Facebook, okay? To the actual Facebook graph. I'm gonna look at least squares rather than maximum likelihood to avoid lower bounds on W. When people use maximum likelihood, they just, I mean, you shouldn't use it on, in these cases because you can't do bipartite graphs anymore. And our theorem says that if W is square integrable, so it includes lots of power laws, um, then you can consistently estimate. So you can take Facebook today, you can get an approximation to the limiting Facebook, you can then use that approximation to generate graphs by coming up with, let's say, two endpoints. I wanna know what it's gonna be when it's twice as big, plugging them all in, flipping coins with that, those probabilities as W of X1, X27, and I can generate, and I can start to tell you properties, and Edo is using it to get, you know, to, to, to tell LinkedIn who he should connect with whom at that time, so you can consistently estimate. The final piece is something that happened um, when we came to Theory Day here. Adam Smith, who is a wonderful person who was on the original differential privacy paper with Cynthia Dwork, was giving a talk on differential privacy, and so what is a privacy problem for databases? Well, given a database with information about, um, information about individuals, can we release statistical information without violating their privacy? And this is relevant and difficult for graphs because it's not only the properties of my node that reveal things about me. 
but just who I'm connected to. For example, you know, your sexual orientation. It can be surmised with, you know, with a high probability just by seeing who you're connected to. So if my friends reveal their sexual orientation, okay, then you might know my sexual orientation, okay? And naive anonymization can often be undone, so one needs a more principled approach. So Dwork et al. with one of the et al's in the original paper being Adam Smith. Um, this goes back to about 2000. Um, a, a randomized algorithm is ep epsilon node private if by pulling me out of the graph, the probability of any event you can calculate on that graph doesn't change by more than epsilon, okay? So I'm in the graph, I'm out of the graph, it doesn't matter, the probabilities don't change very much. There's an analogous definition for edge privacy which is much easier to achieve, but you know, if I pull an edge out, but I don't really care about pulling edges out, I don't want you to find information about me. If I pull this edge out, you know, maybe my connection to Christian still reveals what I don't want you to know about me, okay? So previous work was mostly on edge privacy and dense graphs, and you've gotta remember that L infinity still includes sparse graphs, just sparse graphs with a bound W, so not power law, but still sparse graphs, okay? And so we have node private estimation of general sparse graph funds in L infinity. We use this thing um, which Frank McSherry and Kunal Tower came up with, um, a nice mechanism to make things private. And, uh, and, and what we did was we showed that we could modify their mechanism in such a way that on arbitrary input, the modified algorithm was epsilon no, no private, meaning you pull me out and probability of anything doesn't change by more than epsilon, and you can consistently estimate. Okay, okay, and everywhere we turn, so we've done these three things now. We've gone from graphs to their limits. We've shown that once you have one of these Ws, you can use it as a generator of interesting models. And furthermore, we've shown that you can consistently estimate that starting with Facebook today, you can estimate an approximation, W hat to the real God-given W that would correspond to that. And then if I use that W to stick in X's and Y's and flip my coins and generate things, I will really get something that consistently estimates some other, you know, uh, uh, Facebook at twice the size or other properties. Okay, so the theory of graph convergence is a way to compare graphs, to understand what are the fundamental properties. Dense graphs, we have all these notions that are the same. Bounded degree graphs, very few notions are the same. Sparse unbounded degree graphs, under particular kinds of conditions, which I haven't really told you, we are able to get many of, um, many of the equivalences. If you have these functions, you have two different ways of generating random graphs, I can either change my normalization, okay, which does some very nice things, but it does make them not projective, or I can stretch my space, okay, and then they're both projective and exchangeable, and they have very long tails, and you really have to look at your data to see which one does better for you. And then, you should be, when you have very large graphs, using non-parametric stochastic block models so you don't overfit. And you can consistently estimate very general unbounded average degree power law graphs corresponding to unbounded W, this kind. We're just writing up this kind. <laughs> um, and you can consistently and differentially privately estimate unbounded average degree sparse graphs corresponding to bounded W, not power laws, but at least much more than dense graphs. Okay, that's it.